The Understudy by Fizzle Up on AO3. Chapter 1. The Hook. You knew talking to yourself was a sign of you really needing to be more social. Let's run the simulation again, only this time tweak the algorithm just a bit, you muttered, yawning as you typed on your keyboard. Your computer easily ran the program, the best computer equipment you ever laid eyes on. Honestly, it seemed a little wasteful. There was nothing wrong with the old computer. But you supposed it gave the other skeletons a peace of mind to have the newest equipment used. Getting the machine rebuilt might have been the first step, but they needed to figure out what went wrong before they could undo the damage. Well, we know what went wrong, just not exactly what they did, you muttered, watching the numbers and graphs play out on your monitor. It struck you then how out of your league you were with the situation. You were majoring for engineering for God's sake, hadn't even finished your degree yet. You were going to have to talk to the skeletons about extending their circle of trust and get some more brains on this. It was no longer a project with no deadline. Time was a factor since they didn't know what could be happening to the others. Of course, explaining recent events to other engineers and scientists would sound like something out of a sci-fi movie. You took a moment to survey the living room you were working in. Broken and burnt circuitry lying on clear plastic sheets, laying everywhere. The guest house space was really being pushed to its limits. Probably would have made more sense to have all this at the mansion, but no way that was happening. Your return came with a couple of requirements. One being how you would do most of your work at the guest house, away from the others. A big change from how things used to go, but then everything changed. Knock, knock. You found yourself tensing. There was no reason for anyone to be visiting you tonight. The discussion of your work was supposed to happen first thing in the morning, and after taking a second to think, you realized you recognized the knock itself. Only one monster made a knock sound like the intro of a song. You found yourself instantly looking at your t-shirt and jeans, slightly wrinkled, then cursed yourself for even caring how you looked. None of that stuff matters now. It never really did in the first place. You muttered to yourself as you got up. You walked towards the door, instinctively slowing your steps. Some part of you not wanting to open it, just wait and hope the skeleton on the other side would go away. Trying to mentally shake your nerves off, you took a deep breath and turned the doorknob. There stood Blue, a couple of inches taller than you, appearing stout and large, physically intimidating if it weren't for the gentle face. Had his blue bandana tied around his neck as always, underneath it was a black shirt, blue leather jacket, and jeans. Your brain instantly latched onto details you wished didn't pop in your head. Normally Blue always wore his armor ever since a certain someone said it made him dashing. It's been months since he wore normal clothes, and you could count on your hand the number of times he wore the leather jacket, the one you bought him as a present when... Greetings, boyfriend! I'm sorry, say what? Um, what did you just say? You asked, figuring your mind was playing tricks on you. Blue rolled his cyan eyes, a smile not leaving his face. Jeez, they really are working you hard. I said greetings, of course. Yeah, I, um, meant the word after. Now please close your eyes, Blue said, shifting from foot to foot. That's when you realized the monster was holding something behind his back. It was really too late to play games, but you closed your eyes. Blue didn't need you stressing him out, considering what he went through. Regardless of the history you two had... You were actually glad to see him getting his cheerful demeanor back. You felt something placed in your hands. Okay, you can open your eyes now. You followed the request, finding yourself looking down at a watch. A very expensive watch from the looks of it. It was a combination of gold and blue steel, the colors matching together perfectly. Set to the exact time and probably cost a lot more than the leather jacket you bought him. Blue, I can't really accept this, you said, tensing as you spoke the words. You didn't want to upset him. He was in a fragile state. At the same time, though, 
taking something like this from him felt wrong. I know you're not big on anniversaries, but I really wanted us to celebrate, boyfriend. Okay, now you did hear the word clearly, and it produced all sorts of emotions. Nothing good. Bewilderment, anger, and even a little fear ran through your head. Why are you calling me that? In the end, you decided to seek understanding, but a part of you said there wasn't going to be any logical explanation for any of this. Boyfriend, are you okay? I think I'll talk to the others about giving you a break, Blue said, hand placed on your shoulder and giving it a squeeze. The squeeze was followed by him lowering his head, so casual about entering your personal space. You were stepping back a couple of steps before you even recognized what you were doing. We aren't... We were never... You never wanted to be that. You were shaking slightly, almost dropping your gift in the process. This was too much. It hurt too much. Blue finally stopped smiling, frowning as he noticed you shaking. I I've upset you somehow, boyfriend. I must be doing something wrong. I'll let you rest, but please keep the gift. It's my one-month anniversary gift to you. <laughs> one-month anniversary? You repeated dumbly. You knew this somehow related to his loss, to his pain at what he suffered. You weren't sure how. Of course! The one-month anniversary since we confessed our feelings to each other! Boom! You slammed the door, harder than you probably ever slammed any door before. You'd swear the hinges nearly popped off. The watch falling to the floor as you shakily turned the lock on. You paused there, waiting nearly holding your breath as you listened on the other side. Finally, after almost a full minute, you heard Blue walking away. It took another minute before you also moved, grabbing the watch from the floor. You placed it on the kitchen counter and went straight for the phone. You called the head of the skeleton family, knowing he'd answer right away once he saw you on caller ID. Hey there. No, I didn't find anything new. I'm calling because I have a new requirement for my services. I, I'll tell you more later, but to put it simply, a new requirement for me being here is having Blue go to therapy. You were asked for details behind your request, but kept the conversation short. You were tired, you were going to sleep, and you would talk to him tomorrow about why you insisted on this. After hanging up the phone, you walked over and picked up your one-month anniversary gift. What's going on with him? You asked the watch, not really expecting an answer back. Blue had only been half right. It was a month since something significant happened. It was a month since you did confess your feelings to Blue, and he ripped your heart out. Oh, thank you. This is so lovely. Why, of course. Only the best for my lady. Black said with a grin, taking a pose. Tiffany stared down at the pendant an amethyst finely cut in the center of it. She put it on with a grin, followed by a kiss on Black's cheek. The skeleton's cheeks turned deep purple. It was obvious from the way he waited in the living room, he couldn't wait to surprise her with the gift. Out of all the skeletons, he was probably the most... materialistic. Oh, sure, she got gifts from others, but Black was the one who went for high-dollar jewelry and clothing to give her and sometimes maybe she gave a little direction to the gift given, like how yesterday she mentioned a classmate wearing the prettiest pendant. You would never know she was someone whose income came from online art commissions and babysitting jobs with the way she dressed, blouses and shirts worth over a hundred dollars because Black and also Edge would insist she wear the best and she was always getting to eat the best foods because one of the skeletons insisted on going to really nice places. Speaking of food... Oh, can you excuse me, Black? I need to talk to Papyrus about our spaghetti date. Tiffany said with a wink. The skeleton's grin stifled slightly, but came back in full force. Of course, my lady. Let me know if you need anything further from me. Black said, doing a bow. She giggled as she curtsied in return. She had a strong suspicion he took up the chivalry behavior up a notch around her, but she loved it. Made her think she was in a medieval time being treated as a princess. It was even better when Blue came around dressed in his awesome armor. Of course, my lord. Good day to you. 
Tiffany said with a wave before heading to the kitchen. She was glad he didn't make a fuss about not getting more attention. All the skeletons were starting to understand she only had so much time on her hands. She credited it with the soul bonds she shared with them. She found the tall skeleton looking through a recipe book. She could still remember when she walked him through how to properly make spaghetti. It took a week, but the lessons finally stuck. A necessary move, since his first serving of spaghetti nearly got her food sickness. Luckily, Sands helped make her food disappear with a shortcut, just like his own. Reader wasn't so lucky and ended up repeatedly throwing up that night and the following day. Getting ready for a spaghetti date? Tiffany asked teasingly as she tickled Papyrus's ribs. The skeleton jumped slightly, orange blush showing up on cheekbones. Ah, Tiffany, I was actually going to try a new recipe. I found this chicken salad recipe that I know you'll love. Papyrus said with a wide smile. Uh-oh, looks like someone was expanding outside their comfort zone. Which was fine when she had Sans as backup to sneak bad food away, but no way was she risking it on a solo date with Paps. Papyrus, I was really looking forward to spaghetti, though. I mean, you're the spaghetti-making genius. Could we please have spaghetti this time? Tiffany asked placing one hand on her heart and fluttering her eyelashes. She had the pose down to a science, and it worked every time on most of the skeletons. Well, I wouldn't want to disappoint you. Of course I'll make my delicious spaghetti, Papyrus said, raising one finger to the air. Crisis averted. She leaned forward and kissed his cheek. Thank you, Papyrus. I know it'll taste wonderful, Tiffany said not noticing the slight slump in shoulders as she turned and headed out the kitchen. She did feel a slight pang of guilt as she left the kitchen. A small part of her wanted Papyrus to protest, to not give in so easily. It was the way of things with all the skeletons, though. They never refused her when she wanted something different done. It was like she was Snow White and they were the Seven Dwarves. Sticking to the said reference, she decided to head upstairs to see Grumpy. Red. To make small talk, of course, and mention the date with Papyrus, just to see his reaction. All the other skeletons acted totally okay with her, speaking about their cousins and brothers, what fun times she was going to have with them, and so forth. Red still, though, got flustered and jealous when she so much as mentioned another skeleton. Red, you there? Tiffany asked with a grin, knocking on the door. Come on in, sweetheart. The baritone sound of his voice always made Tiffany shiver. Much to her shame, she almost wanted to cancel the date happening just to hang out with Red at Grilby's bar. Papyrus was a sweet ray of sunshine, but Red made parts of her tingle with excitement both inside and outside the bedroom. I just wanted to talk. How are things going? Tiffany asked as she jumped onto bed next to Red and leaned against him. She always enjoyed how big and warm the skeletons were. She could feel the heat coming off Red's ribs as she leaned against him. Almost got all the parts for my road king in the garage, babe. You're gonna love it when I put it together, Red said with a toothy grin. A road king? Oh, he means the motorcycle. Wait, I think I'm supposed to call it a chopper. Ooh, I can't wait! I'm going to love how it feels when I'm holding you and we're speeding down the road, Tiffany said, maybe laying it on a little thick. She actually wasn't crazy about motorcycles, but she could fake liking them for Red's sake. Why wait on the holding part? You can hold me tonight and ride me. Promise it'll feel even better than being on my bike. Red whispered soft and low, putting a large arm around her waist and giving her a squeeze. Red, please. I don't know how to respond when you say things like that, Tiffany said, turning her eyes to the floor. She knew he liked it when she suddenly acted shy and uncertain. Didn't matter they had sex more times than she could count. He always fell for the whole, I'm practically a virgin act. Come on, babe. I'll make you feel good tonight, Red said, voice promising all sorts of pleasures. She pulled away, no real fear in him not letting go. I'm sorry, but I have a date with Papyrus tonight, Tiffany said, putting a hand to her heart. You don't say. And there it was, something which got Tiffany even more excited than his sexy voice. 
the hands squeezing into fists, the red eyes glowing and the teeth grinding. He had no muscles, technically, but she'd swear somehow the arms flexed under his jacket. Maybe his bones just got larger when he got agitated. Still, it was a sight she never got tired of, seeing him looking ready to pounce on someone and pound them for taking her time away from him. Oh yes, he's going to make spaghetti and we're going on a picnic to... She continued talking for ten minutes, acting totally oblivious to how his hands continued to clench and he shifted on the bed. Finally, she decided to stop when she noticed he was poking holes in the blanket. If she didn't leave soon, he'd be ripping the mattress apart, and no way could she keep the act up if that happened. She gave a quick goodbye as she headed out. This was a good time to get ready. She had to look her best for the date with Papyrus. First, though, she stopped in front of another door. This one? Blue's bedroom. She pulled out an envelope and slid it under the door, knowing he was out doing errands. She had rewritten the letter five times before she was satisfied with it, making sure it noted how she yearned for the monster and deep down always had feelings for him, which she couldn't fight anymore. Okay, maybe some of it was made up, but love letters weren't supposed to be totally honest anyway. And she was developing feelings for the guy now. It wasn't her fault those said feelings only started happening a couple of days ago. It was Reader's fault, really. He shouldn't have made it so hard to find alone time with Blue. And this was for the best. Reader would only be taking Blue away from his family if they got even more serious. It only made sense for her. The girl already soul-bonded with the others. She can link to Blue, and they'll all live happily ever after. I really can't get fairy tales out of my head today, Tiffany said with a giggle as she approached her room.